Hello and welcome to Connected. On this edition, what does it take to be a commercial airline pilot? We'll do some flying high and find out. Summer is ramping up and we have vital information on how you can prepare your home for the bushfire season ahead. Can't find a good cuppa in the mornings? We go and search for the best coffee in town. And musically independent singer-songwriter Joey Miller takes a look at the birds and the bees. It's time to keep it local and get connected. It's a job that has been immortalised on the silver screen by everyone from Tom Cruise to Leonardo DiCaprio and even the Duke, John Wayne. The lure of reaching to the heavens as an airline pilot is a very attractive prospect for many. But what does it take to be Top Gun? Do you have the right stuff to go flying high? Well, commercial airline pilot and aviation lecturer Dr Wayne Martin joins us on Connected. How are you, Wayne? Good, thanks, Tony. Mate, uh, how did your interest in flying begin? Um, I'd always had an interest uh, as, a, as a child and uh, was fortunate enough to get accepted into the Air Force when I left school. Uh, so I spent 10 years uh, in the Air Force, uh, mostly on a uh, Hercules aircraft. Right. And uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that before moving into the uh, commercial airline. And that was in New Zealand, wasn't it? It was actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So moving across the ditch, as they say, yeah. uh, and coming to Australia, and, uh, and what, uh, where did you go from there? Um, so uh, I, I operated uh, a number of different aircraft for about three different airlines in New Zealand uh, before uh, joining uh, Virgin Australia, based in New Zealand, and uh, spent six years there before coming across to the Triple uh, Seven flying long haul for Virgin. So you've been flying commercially for quite some time now. Yeah, so I uh, spent 10 years in the Air Force and 28 years in the airlines. So wow, that's yeah. amazing. So what, what sort of routes do you normally fly? Because you're still flying now. I am. Uh, I'm actually a full-time uh, 777 pilot. Uh, we operate uh, at the moment just to LA and to Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, understand that we'll be starting uh, Hong Kong and Beijing the second half of next year. So, Is it always nervous, uh, nerve-wracking going into a new uh, airport or something like that? Uh, it's not nerve-wracking. You know, we, we're pretty well prepared. Um, one airport's just like any other to be honest, so uh, mm -hmm. some of them have their little quirks with terrain and things like that, weather, but uh, you know we're we're professional operators, so we've been doing it for a long time. It's uh, it's just something you do. Now, I know while you've been a commercial airline pilot, you've also been uh, getting involved in the training aspects as well, haven't you? Sure, yeah. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time uh, training uh, during my um, both Air Force and commercial pilot uh, uh, careers. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a really uh, fulfilling um, challenging and rewarding sort of a part of the job but mm -hmm. uh, training new pilots as they come on stream and uh, getting them up to speed. Um, uh, I've also been a, an examiner so uh, at the other end of the spectrum where you know, every six months pilots have to be checked to make sure they're up to standard and uh, I've done and that do as well. That, you know, like in the, in the use of simulators and things like that don't yeah, you? Yeah it's predominantly done in simulators so once a year we do a, a, a line check so out in the actual aircraft doing the job. Yep as well but uh, yeah, twice a year we're in the simulator getting checked on emergency procedures predominantly. Right now of course uh, you're also taking a different route again, uh, pardon the pun, uh, but uh, becoming a, a university lecturer as well. What made you decide to, to go into that training aspect? Um, I've been uh, involved in academia for uh, about 15 years or so, uh, um, four degrees down the track, uh, one of which is a doctorate um, in uh, human factors which is my specialty area. Um, and uh, really enjoy the, the academic training side of things. Uh, I was been involved as a postgraduate uh, lecturer for six years prior to coming to USQ. Right. And um, it's just a, a, a sort of an add-on, uh, you know, training uh, education in general is just something that uh, I really enjoy. Well, of course, setting up, uh, you're instrumental in setting up the aviation course for the uh, University of Southern Queensland. Uh, I guess it must have been great to, uh, to start from the ground up, as it were, and build the programs. Uh, yes, uh, a greenfield uh, program is just uh, great. Yeah, we've stamped our, our uh, uh, feel on the program. We think uh, we've put a, a, a program together that's got a lot of utility, and we think will be very attractive to uh, a number of people. Um, 
And, and what does the course that you've established offer students? Okay, so what we have is a three-year bachelor's program at the moment, um, where the first year is on campus, and it's completely focused towards building students, most of who come straight out of high school, into um, the, a position where at the end of the degree they can walk straight into a commercial airline pilot's job. So uh, the first year is academically based on campus uh, and it's all aviation related stuff, prepares them for the flight training which is in year two. Mm -hmm. Year three is uh, online or on campus and uh, it's uh, once again just topping up their professional development, uh, their professional knowledge so that uh, when somebody is competing for a job at the end um, that they stand head and shoulders above somebody who's just been through a flying school. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember reading somewhere that uh, there's actually going to be a shortage of pilots as well. Absolutely, they're uh, forecasting the need for something like 650,000 pilots uh, worldwide in the next 20 years. Uh, in Australia, we're currently tra training about 2,000 uh, pilots a year. We probably need to ramp up to five to 10,000 pilots a year wow. to help contribute towards that especially with Asia Pacific being one of the areas that's uh, highest growth. So can anyone take the course? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, there are no real, um, you know, really stringent prerequisites. Uh, English and, and basic maths is about all you need. Uh, but it's, it's, it's more about uh, you know, how you apply uh, the, the information that we're providing you. Yeah. Well, it sounds great, mate, and I can't wait to get into that simulator myself. Uh, yeah, it'll we're be a lot of fun. to get in the simulator uh, <laughs> after Christmas. That's right, you're getting one at USQ too. Yes, so. we are. Right? It's a 737-based uh, simulator, so uh, it'll, it'll be fantastic. Great uh, tool for research and for training. All the very best for it, Wayne. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tony. And if you would like uh, more information on the aviation opportunities available at the University of Southern Queensland, visit usq.edu.au. Still to come, what goes into making the best cup of morning coffee? We debut a young Toowoomba singer-songwriter and next, fire season is upon us. So what can you do to avoid tragedy? Stay with us and keep connected. Welcome back to the program. Well, with bushfire season just around the corner, South East Queensland residents are encouraged to finalise bushfire preparations now. According to some reports, this season will create an above average threat of bushfire. And to find out how to minimise the risk for you and your family, we are joined by Westmorton Bushfire Safety Officer Mark Saunders. Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, uh, it almost feels like we've gone straight from, uh, from winter to summer. Uh, we, we've got to start preparing if we haven't already. Yep, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so, um, we as the uh, Rural Fire Service Queensland, we'd like to recommend that uh, residents start preparing their homes at this time of year in preparation for the bushfire se season. Of course, we've just seen uh, amazing legislation come through where we've had to go to the electric um, smoke detectors in homes, uh, in new homes and things like that. Got to be a step in the right direction, hasn't it? Yep, that's a, that's a big step. And uh, yeah, we definitely recommend that people start looking at installing them. There is a, a, uh, a time frame that we're looking at over that. And, and uh, yeah, and we need people to uh, move to that. It's much better technology, uh, provides better safety. And as you've seen recently, a lot of homes have been burnt down in southeast Queensland. Uh, and we, you know, it was one of the recommendations out of the, the disastrous Logan Lee fire from a few years ago. Yes, yeah. So. And of course, what people don't recognise too is it's not just their home, but they also have the, uh, with a fire, the ability to impact a neighbour's property or something like that as well. Yes, yes. Just last week, we had a, a house loss that was the adjoining house. Mm. Um, and, and unfortunately, there were some issues out there, but uh, that can happen in many occasions. And, and a lot of uh, times, our um, urban counterparts, they spend a lot of time defending the adjoining properties to. Um, as the main property itself might be already lost, so it's a matter of protecting other assets at that point. One of the other risk factors that we've got coming up too is that there's been a prediction of a much higher storm activity in South East Queensland. For bushfires, that's ringing alarm bells, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, so we've got a, a La Nina watch on at the present time from the Bureau of Meteorology, and they're, um, they're suggesting that we potentially could have a, um, more storms than we'd normally see into the storm season. Um, the issue that we can have from storms is sometimes if a storm's come through as a dry storm, we get a lightning strike, starts a fire, and then we've got a bushfire that's on our doorsteps. So mm. 
um, storms can give us some trouble. Uh, and, and we've seen after tropical cyclone Marsha, a different sto style storm, um, a lot of debris left on the ground afterwards, so trees are stripped of stuff. And in those localised areas, that can also increase fuel loads to lead to further storms in the f um, coming seasons. Because what we don't realise too, especially with bushfires, is that they can move so rapidly, but uh, they can ignite by flying embers into uh, gutters that may be filled up with leaf debris and all that sort of thing. That's right. So we, um, we always recommend that people, as part of their bushfire preparation, uh, clean their gutters out, um, clean up um, loose debris from their backyards and that, which is the same as for a storm. Uh, we try and use um, the plants that are less likely to um, combust in fires around next to their homes and, and try and keep foliage away from the houses. Try and keep your major trees from the houses. You may have to check with your council bylaws on that though. Yeah. Um, and yeah, basically try and keep the fuel loads, which I mean by fuel loads, the vegetation amounts lower around your homes. Uh, on your verandas and that don't have um, don't have um, like the old style doormats and um, flammable toys or lounges and stuff like that which can also ignite from the amber attack. And, and of course even simple things like mowing your grass regularly can help as well. Definitely yep yep that's all part of the fuel load out there so you keep it nice and short uh, it won't stop a fire going across it but the intensity of fire will be a lot less which will give you the ability to fight your own fire because you've got to remember we don't have enough fire trucks in South East Queensland to have a fire truck at every door yep. of every house so you need to be able to be able to prepare and defend your own home or take the other option of leaving if you don't feel you've got that capability to defend your home. Yeah, and, and of course uh, you mentioned that you know the fire is when they are called out. I mean one of the other things that can also hinder them getting to a location is you know clearly marking your house with the street number and, and knowing where you are located. That's a big one, knowing where you're located um, helps our Firecom girls and boys um, or men um, greatly to get assistance here a lot quicker. The other big one there is making sure your access is actually big enough to allow a fire truck to come through. So right. there's some recommendations on our website uh, with regards to that and, and you need to be big enough. If we can't get the truck down to your house because of overhead limbs or anything, then we're not going to endanger our crews mm -hmm. and, and therefore we can't, um, and the resources, because we can use them better at another location. So we, um, we recommend people make sure that their access is uh, free of um, limbs, overhanging limbs and are wide enough through the gates and that to allow our trucks to come through. It's all good advice mate, I know that you've only uh, been in this job for what, about three months? Yep. Yeah. Um, so how are you enjoying it? Uh, I'm enjoying it a lot, I've um, been a volunteer firefighter for over 12 years um, and I've um, come from a local government background in disaster management so it's sort of tying a few skills together yeah. um, and I really enjoy the time working with volunteers um, and, and empowering our volunteers to help their communities a lot further. And especially for uh, you know the uh, the community uh, fire brigades out there uh, and the volunteers. I mean, they do an enormous workload. They leave their jobs to go and fight fires at other people's houses and and leave their own in in the path of danger. Exactly. Uh, I've actually experienced that myself. I've had a fire burn on my own property when I was out fighting fires elsewhere. Um, it's not a nice feeling, but it's you got to do what you do and you're tasked where you're tasked to. So you do that, and um, hopefully the other guys are looking after your property, and and that's what we sort of count on. And the more volunteers we have out there, the more our uh, capability is there for uh, resource from these fires. And of course there's always uh, room for more volunteers, isn't there? Totally. Just get in touch with your local brigade and they'll definitely sign you up and give you the correct training. It's quite professional training these days. Much of it being um, nationally recognised and accredited. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can take a lot of skills away and use it in the other facets of your life. All right. Well, we're going to start getting our homes prepared for the uh, coming summer season. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, all the very best for the new job as well. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you. Good to hear. And prepare your home now by creating an escape plan and also find the checklist of prevention by visiting fire.qld.gov.au. Still to come, independent singer-songwriter Joey Miller and we go and search for the best cup of coffee. That's next on Connected. And welcome back. Well, it's the second most traded commodity in the world, followed uh, closely behind oil. More than 2.5 billion consume it daily worldwide. And in ancient Arab culture, women could legally divorce their husbands if they didn't provide enough of it. 
I'm talking about coffee, of course. Even the first ever webcam was invented at the University of Cambridge to let people know if the coffee pot was full or empty. But what makes it so popular? And why do we continually search for the best cup on the planet? A man who did that and now creates his own is the founder of the Dancing Bean Espresso, Rob Murgard. How are you, Rob? I'm very well, thank you. Mate, great to me. talk to you and great to taste your coffee. I must say, it's a nice drop. Thank you. Trying hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, did the, uh, how long has Dancing Bean uh, been around? Uh, the, the company started in 1999, so we're up to year 17 now. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And of course, how did it start for you, you know, way back uh, 17 years ago? Well, coffee's always been a passion. Before coffee, I was in engineering. And uh, I found myself, when I was uh, living in Sydney, spending a lot of time at the lo local coffee roasters. Right. There, and he would get me to uh, fix machines, that sort of thing. And one thing led to another and uh, decided, you know what, I think I wouldn't mind doing this. Yeah, so you set up your own roasting facility? Not initially. Uh, initially, we, we put the first legal coffee cart into Brisbane, and that was something that um, really interested me back then with the view to roast in the future. Yeah. Um, roasting, we didn't really want to just start roasting and tell people, hey, we've been doing this for five minutes, trust us. Yep. Uh, the, the view was always to supply ourselves first and then others after that. Now, of course, uh, you have now finally set up that, that roasting facility mm -hmm. in Ipswich, haven't you? Well, we've relocated. We were in Brisbane and um, six months ago, we, we just cut our ties with, with Brisbane. Been roasting for seven or eight years in Brisbane. And, uh, but the growth in, in Ipswich and the future growth and, and the buildings that are available here, uh, you, they just ticked all the boxes. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we just, when we saw the building that we're in now, we had to move. Yeah, and we're just taking a look at uh, some vision from uh, from the operation you have there, and uh, and of course, uh, I is it a fully automated uh, roasting system, or do you have hands on still? No, nah, we we're definitely at the boutique end of the spectrum. It's it's very much hands on. You can automate um, roasting; it's 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 possible, but that last ten percent, it, it comes from from, from here. From the heart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so uh, with your facility there, I mean, where do you source your beans from? All over. I mean, we're, we're a boutique uh, coffee company, so we don't hop on a plane and, and go to Ethiopia ourselves. Mm. We have um, you know, agents that will supply us from beans from all around the world. We have a policy. Um, in, in coffee, there's a grading system. So uh, anything over 80 points is exceptional. So our suppliers know uh, to let us to alert us when great beans become available and we, we buy some really fantastic beans. Yeah, uh, and I can test <laughs> give you testament on that <laughs> as well. Uh, and of course, the other thing you do too, which I think is great, is you're also now starting to train other cafe operators of how to make a good brew. Well, that's really important because, uh, like I said, we're, we're boutique, we're small. Uh, our, our name is everything. If we don't train our customers, then it will reflect really badly on us. So it's a symbiotic thing, uh, mm. helps them, helps us. And of course, uh, just looking at uh, this vision now of those beans going in and uh, some of the roasting facility uh, in operation that you have there in Ipswich and in the CBD as well. And of uh, course, you've got a beautiful cafe attached to that as well. Yeah, it's, it's every coffee roaster's dream, that building. It's a, it's a hundred year old building with character. Uh, it's kind of like the best kept secret in town, but we like it like that. People are starting to talk about it now. Yeah, and just look at that. I bet the smells coming out of that roaster is just awesome. Yeah, well, we are living the dream. <laughs> you so. certainly <laughs> are. Uh, future plans quickly for Dancing Bean? Oh, uh, look, there's, there's no going back. You always have to be one step ahead. Uh, roasting is a way of being a step ahead, but there are a lot of other people roasting now. The next steps for us will be reproducing what we've done in Ips Ipswich. We're looking for people who love coffee, that want to actually do what we do, or we'd like to partner with them. And hopping on that plane and going to Ethiopia and sourcing our own beans will yeah. is in the future. Well, mate, uh, you are living the dream. And uh, thank you so much for taking time out to join us today. Thanks for having me. It's great. And you can find out more about Rob and the Dancing Bean by checking out their website, dancingbean.com. Well, now and connected as part of our continued support of local music scene and up and coming artists, we turn our spotlight on a young Toowoomba Uni student who is making ways with his laid back style of songwriting, Joey Miller, and please welcome him to Connected. <laughs> You 
came along He sang a song about something funny I was not ready when you stole my honey But I could not argue with being around you Joey Miller and Bird and Bee. And that just about wraps up this edition of Connected. Make sure you check out our latest guest info and special online segments on our website, connectedtv.com, and interact with the show on our Facebook page. Until next time, stay connected and bye for now. <laughs>